Hello and welcome to the Wednesday night edition of Game On here on New Central Television. My name is Baba Tunde Kweki. Always a pleasure to welcome you to what promises to be the best one hour of sports you can have anywhere. Don't forget, we're streaming live on YouTube and of course we're also streaming live on Twitter as well. So if you're watching via any of the social media apps, we are right there with you. And of course, you can also use the other social media handles, X, Instagram, uh, and of course, uh, I think uh, we're, also, we're also live on uh, uh, TikTok, TikTok, yes, TikTok as well. So you can also join us on that as well. And of course, uh, it's always a pleasure having you with us in the show. On this show, we're not doing this alone. I have three great, uh, two great gentlemen with me in the studio right now. This man makes a return from his sojourn in Ghana uh, after three excellent weeks of a uh, uh, pound of uh, tremendous action in Ghana. Uh, Onyuchi Wanchuku uh, makes a return as well. Thank you so, for joining us. So, yeah, you have this wry smile. Of course, you enjoyed Ghana. I know you enjoyed Ghana. Indeed. Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, we're talk talking about you enjoyed Nigeria's participation in Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we passed through Ghana and Ghana passed through us. Oh, no, that's, a, that's an interesting <laughs> statement. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how to qualify that one, but it's a, it's a good Ooh. statement. So you passed through Ghana and Ghana passed through you. No, you know, the French. They, they have this uh, um, policy of assimilation. Mm -hmm. So you assimilate everything that um, you saw in Ghana. Ah. And also, the Ghana people will also assimilate um, the, the values, the qualities that you have brought <laughs> to their country. So that's what I meant. Okay, so we, we need to get I'm in touch. I'm not yeah, We need to get in touch with the Nigerian embassy in Ghana and find out exactly what happened. The Nigerian High Commission in Ghana and find out exactly what happened in Ghana. Because I, I, I'm not, I, these cryptic messages, I, I don't know what to say. But, no, but, yeah. but I went there as a sports journalist, so mm. I cover everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll get back to you. <laughs> we'll get back to you. But uh, <laughs> Okwe Alibar is also with me in the studio. Okwe, always a pleasure to have you in the studio. Definitely. It's good to be here. Good to have Mr. Miwichi back. It's been a while, so good to have him back. Okay, but, but before we even progress any further, um, let's quickly just get um, you know, your, your, your impressions of the African Games in Ghana. Ghana spent uh, over a quarter of a billion dollars to put that competition together. There's been so much talk uh, about whether it was a great competition or not. Uh, we've been hearing that uh, the athletes were not uh, pleased with the preparation. Ghanaian athletes, uh, we've even heard the volunteers are up in arms saying that uh, the monies they were promised haven't been received. So in your, op uh, your opinion, as an outsider visiting Ghana, how would you rate those games? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the games were exciting. If you talk, if you talk about uh, the facilities, you know, I, I don't think they were magnificent, but the most important thing was that they were functional. They were functional. Mm. And what they did by building that complex inside the sprawling University of uh, Ghana in Legon was strategic. Mm. You know, um, That's the Botiman Sports Complex. No, the Botiman Sports Complex is different. Oh, it's different. It's, it's, it's a, a bit um, a far away from the University of, University of Ghana Sports Stadium. Yes. The stadium is right inside the campus. University of Legon with, with the Legon. main track, with also inside the sports pitch. Yes. You know, so it's a, it's a wonderful combination of education and sports. Mm. You know, I, I think it's strategic. What it means that in, in a few years' time, they are going to be building balanced human beings. Mm. You know, um, it's not just only about sports. When you leave sports, do you still remain relevant? What are you going to do? Uh, what are you going to be doing when you leave sports? So for me, I think it was strategic. Uh, then the hard pockets of facilities here, like the Bottoman Sports Complex you mentioned, they wanted to actually build a stadium, but because time was against, uh, you know, the, this these games was they had really been postponed twice, twice already. Yeah. You know, already. So they had to convert the bottom uh, complex to you know, pockets of indoor, uh, they used halls, the indoor yes, halls yeah. you know, to, to host games. Then they, they had the ICC, International Conference Center, where mm. table tennis. So for me, they didn't give that magnificent facility, but they were functional. All the games took place, and um, I think it's to Ghana's interest, much more than any other person who wanted to see you know, gigantic edifice, who wanted to see you know, uh, sprawling, um, you know, um, um, complexes and all that. But for them, they have just built something that uh, the legacy that will last them in the next 10 years. You remember the handball championship was held in the Bottoman uh, yes, sports complex yes. before this. It was like a test run. Mm. You know, so it's, it's a win-win situation for Ghana. They, they, might, they may have had issues with transportation, logistics. logistics. Mm. And for the issue of the volunteers, you see, I think in Africa, I understand that sometimes government people don't get what they uh, deserve. But mm. when you go to Europe, I've interviewed volunteers, old men, pensioners, and they are happy to serve their country. Mm. I actually, in Birmingham, I, I actually spoke with one of the drivers who, who happens to be a, a pensioner. He said the only thing they gave them was a bottle of Coke mm. and the sandwich. Yeah. And, and a certificate. And 
Yeah. And, and he was I also so, interviewed a few volunteers at uh, the, the, uh, um, the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow yeah. in 2016 yeah. as well. It was the same thing. Yeah. So, but you understand that in those places, government has done a lot. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes, exactly. It reverses the case. Mm. So, if you people are complaining, then you can that. understand. If the government officials, the LOC members, have actually promised them, then they should have you know, fulfilled their promises to them. Mm. I totally mm. agree. But I want to pick from yeah. something he said, mm. which is the fact that the facilities were not. Fantastic. I think that but functional. Well, but they were functional. But I think that also makes sense to why the South African hockey team said, "Look, these facilities are not up to standard for us." Considering the fact that you know they have been to international competitions yeah. and for their standard, because they are a very vibrant team, they felt that it wasn't up to standard. But then again, just like you said, it was functional. That's why the hockey tournament did go on in the African Games. But nevertheless, you know, in terms of social media, what I did see before the games, I honestly thought that the facilities were top notch. So for you to use the word functional, but not fantastic, we then begin to wonder, could there have been a possibility where they could have used the funds for something better? Or could they have channeled it in a much better way in terms of, should I say, upgrading the standard of the facilities? Yeah, I, did, I, did, I, I think, yeah. I also think, you know, the, the Accra Sports Stadium, where the men's football games um, were held, mm. they didn't give it a facelift. And some of us were saying, okay, even if you are not going to do massive renovation, at least... Paint At least paint, it. like yeah. we do here. Just paint. Paint and, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we give yeah. a facelift to the toilets and all that, mm. that things. When I got there, I was asking, because having gone to, you know, inter international, international competitions, competitions yes. you understand that uh, every venue must have a media center. I, w I looked very stupid when I was asking them, where is the media yeah. center? They took me around, showing me different. I said, no, this is not a media center. There must be a media center for each venue. It may not be as big as the main complex. The main mm. complex will have a big media center, but every facility uh, must have a media, must have center. A media center so where, where you can, you know, collate whatever you have. Uh, that are Stories, stay pictures, in file them and send so them I, back. I think they were, they were really not prepared, but in, for what they have, they were able to, you know, host the event. For instance, at the University of um, Ghana Sports Stadium, where the main, you know, the athletics, most of the events were held, the media center was directly in, inside the stadium. Mm. So you had um, people who had no business with media, infiltrating, causing, making noise, and you know, causing issues. They, they, ha they even exchange, um, you know, physical with wow. uh, Trump. So, wow. you know, in terms of organization, it could have been better. It could have been better. It could have been but better. Give it to them. Mm. The competition has come and gone. Yes, and the honest truth is that we never really want to see white elephant projects in Africa. So absolutely, that you, cannot that you cannot yeah. maintain. So, yeah. if these ones they, they yeah. said they were functional, very functional, that's good enough for me. Yeah. Well, let's move on very quickly and uh, also talk a bit more about some basketball. And don't forget that the Paris 2024 Olympic Games are. are fast upon us, and thankfully, we do have a Nigerian national team that will be competing at these games. The Nigerian women's national basketball team, the Tigresses, uh, they will be uh, in the Olympic Games, despite the fact that they qualified by winning just one game at the Olympic qualifying tournament in Antwerp, Belgium, and they've been handed a very, very tough draw. Of course, uh, in case you've been wondering, uh, they've been fixed in Group B alongside Canada, Australia, and hosts France. According to the fixtures that will be released, uh, the Tigers will play their opening game against Australia on the 29th of July. They will, they will now face host France on the 1st of August by 4.15 p.m. before facing Canada three days later. And those uh, games will all be played at the Stade Pierre Maroy. That is the same, same stadium that uh, uh, Lille used. That, that's the uh, French League onside Lille. And so, yeah, we now know exactly how these Tigers are going to, uh, do I say, uh, compete. At the, game, at the games, we know the, the order in which they are going to face uh, their opponents, Australia first, uh, then France, then Canada, all tough teams, uh, but you, uh, they've never won a game at the Olympic Games before. Okay, they never won, but they've done appreciably well at the World Cup. Is it that the standard of both competitions are not equal, or is just tougher? Uh, tougher. I think tougher is the word. Because then again... The Olympics is tougher than the World Cup. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because at the Olympics, you have more um, of an array of countries as compared to the World Cup. So if I go into details in, in sense of groupings, so for, for example, um, right now in this group for the Olympics, Nigeria is currently grouped with a, a country from North America, a country from Oceania, Europe. and a country from Europe. So as, as opposed to the World Cup, in the World Cup, it's possible for them to have one other African country in the same group as them. Then again, going into competition basis, I think for the, the Tigers, for, for me, I think they actually compete in a fair amount of events yearly, in my own opinion. And also for the, the Tigers, they have more of a solid camp. There's more 
consistency for them as compared to um, the Tigers, in my own opinion. In terms and, of call-ups? Exactly. Of, yeah. And then in, in terms of the, 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 regu the regularity of players that do represent them. But the problem is, for me, is the fact that for the females, there seems not to be continuity within the local league. So that's a problem. And then we have a lot of... Do you even have a local league? Exactly. You should ask yourself that Exactly. Question. exactly. I mean, that, that's really the problem. And then you rely on players from um, overseas. Then again, co competition compared to other African countries, that's one thing. Now, I'm very much afraid going into the Olympics. Why? We couldn't even pick up more than one win in Belgium. In the and that win was against a, a fellow African team. Exactly. Senegal, so. so going into this now, I know the prowess of France. I know the prowess of Australia. Honestly, it's only the game against Canada that I think we could get something out of. But I'm hoping that um, they prove me wrong. Uh, it's hope, hope all again. Uh, we should call. We should probably change the name of Nigeria <laughs> to hope. We're always hoping anytime it comes to sports. So there you see uh, Nigeria's uh, fixtures. Uh, in the groupings, it's uh, Serbia, Spain, China, and uh, that's Puerto Rico. In uh, Group A, it's Canada, Nigeria, Australia, and France. In Group B, while it's Group C, it's Germany, the United States of America, who are world champions, Japan, and Belgium. So that's how the uh, the women's basketball event uh, will shape out will shape up uh, at the Olympic Games. Sadly, the men did not qualify. Let's move on. Still talking about the Paris Olympic Games, Kenya are celebrating the qualification of a fencer uh, at, for the Olympic Games. Yes, her name is Alexandra Ndolo, and she qualified for the Paris Olympic Games, uh, the first Kenya to compete in fencing at the Olympic Games. Uh, and of course, uh, she she went on to uh, social media, thanking everyone uh, officially heading to Paris. Uh, hard work, uh, to, thanks to my friends, family, and coaches. Uh, unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly, uh, she's a um, uh, mixed race, mixed race. So I think it's, it's pretty much safe to understand how and why she picked up fencing because, yes, fencing exists on the African continent. It's pretty strong in North, uh, North Africa and South Africa, only, but it seems that we will always need to rely on athletes who are born um, um, outside the continent in, diaspora. in, in the yeah. diaspora for them to for us to have, to have some kind of competitive advantage in these kind of, um, do I say, uh, unique sports, things like equestrian, things like, uh, like fencing, for instance? Well, I think she, she can enjoy the euphoria, you know, really, because I, I don't key into that kind of euphoria. It happened in Nigeria some mm. time ago. We had a bobsled team. We, had, mm, yeah. we celebrated, you know, yeah. but this... You know, give it to them. These, these sportsmen and women are in the diaspora. How does it reflect the development of the sports in these countries? After the bus led, what happened to the game in the country, in Nigeria? Nothing has happened. Yeah, well, they still the skeleton federation. And they, still go, they went for a competition, I think, in South Korea a few years ago. Yeah, I mean, we have not even, you know, we went to the African Games, right? And we came second. Egypt, um, we are the winners. You imagine their budget. You imagine the investment mm. in infrastructure in talent development. Just, just, to, sorry, just to cut you short, oh, yeah. sorry to cut you short, okay. but doing a comparative analysis of uh, Egypt at the African Games in yeah. 2019, yeah. Uh, compared, to 20, uh, compared to 2024, 2023, yeah. they won a difference of eight gold medals. They won eight more gold medals than they did last time around. As for Nigeria, we won one, just one more gold medal. So, so the difference is clear. You know, look at the young girl of 16 that won gold in the singles event of table tennis. Mm. Defeating her competitors, uh, you know. So, so in the next 15, 20 years, she's, she's likely going to dominate the scene. This is not rocket science; it's not mere coincidence. So, I think we should, um, as Africans, maybe uh, all this fencing and this thing, they are okay, you know, once in a while from that. But we should concentrate in developing the ones that we already have, the ones that we know best. We know best, <laughs> you know. I, I congratulate the Kenyan, but it's for her, you know, she can enjoy the euphoria, like I said. But it it doesn't it doesn't impact. You know, so much on the continent. Well, because if, if, like if, if, if you go and ask the average Kenyan, they probably does not know what fencing is. <laughs> but they know long distance racing. They, they know track and field. Track and field. Mm. You know, they, Box, boxing, boxing, football, you yeah. know, football, but, fencing. You know, but some of those athletes will be complaining that, uh, like, um, that like he said, that so, so, some of them we are not giving enough. You know, if I begin to unveil some of the things I heard about, <laughs> you know, our preparation. You know, though Ladam Boso um, paraded the mediocre side, he complained that <laughs> 13, they had 13 days to prepare for the African Games. Exactly. And they played three uh, low-profile friendlies. You know, some, some other sports, like hockey, he talked about, said they have not played on that pitch in their lives. <laughs> you know, so they just go to Ghana and, you know, they were you know, stampeded 
into, into playing, into playing mm -hmm. on that. So these are not, uh, every time they talk about uh, hope and Nigerian spirit, the only spirit that can make you win medals at the uh, Nations Cup, I mean at the Olympics, is the spirit of preparation. Preparation. Yeah. Mm. You Adequate know, preparation. High, uh, you know, high uh, performance uh, training centers, mm. Uh, training amongst the best in excellent the world. Facilities. Excellent facilities. Those are the spirit Great coaches. Not investment, in Nigeria. Investment, I, investment, I investment. I agree. Not in I, Nigeria agree. Spirit. I agree. Uh, I, to I totally agree with both you gentlemen. A, a lot more needs to be done in order to move Nigeria sports forward. It cannot all be lip service and, and hope all the time. And uh, hoping on the Nigerian spirit because at some point, everybody else, apart from Nigerian spirit, we also throw the Holy Spirit into the mix as well. And, and a lot of teams prepare much better. Uh, only to perform much better. Let's uh, keep on talking about international sports and tell you that Russia is pressing ahead with its plans to hold the World Friendship Games. 36 sports will definitely feature in two centers of Moscow and Yekaterinburg. And of course, they, according to the Russians, they said it will be a record-breaking tournament in terms of its size and preparation. Uh, 208 sports disciplines, 283 medals. And of course, the international well, IOC continue to insist that this competition is in violation of the Olympic spirit, and it is just Russia trying to whitewash its international image. Uh, okay, I, I do, <laughs> we've talked about this in the yeah. past. Yeah. Considering the fact that Russia has been ostracized from international sport, they do have a right to want to institute the, the Friendship Games. And it's, not ha it's happened before. It happened in 1984, when a lot of countries boycotted the Olympic Games in 1984 and held their own Friendship Games. So why is there so much hue and cry about another friendship games, uh, but basically 40 years down the line. Because of the why. Why is it happening now? It's because of, definitely because they've been whitewashed by the Olympics. Mm. But why? It's because of what goes on from the political aspect. Then again, you might want to bring up the case of Israel and Gaza and say maybe yes, uh, the same exactly. treatment should be given to them. However, the focus right now is on Russia and what has happened. But to make it worse, or, or to make, uh, to, to just say give a broader view um, to the whole event, Russia has insisted that these games are going to go on similarly in the same calendar. Or, or rather, it's, it's going to be after, after the, the Olympics, Olympics yes, but September. straight after, right, in September, between the, from the 15th to the 29th of September. Mm. But in hind view, taking a look into the future, they're also going to have um, the Winter Friendship Games, the same year that we're going to have yeah, the Winter, winter Olympics. Olympics. Yes. So as far as I'm concerned, um, the motive is quite clear. It's to compete with the Olympics. And probably eventually, maybe in their own opinion or in their mind, they might want to give the Olympics a run for, for their money. Yeah. But really, at the end of the day, they are still fighting to have a voice at the Olympics. In international sports. Exactly. exactly. We're talking about Generally. Sports, sports like archery, badminton, beach soccer, beach volleyball, cycling, fencing, karate, uh, taekwondo, weightlifting, wrestling. Sports Honestly, are, it was well thought out. We've heard, well we've heard oh yeah, that um, they are willing to pay countries <laughs> to come and compete. <laughs> so, I mean, if I may... Burundi or Djibouti, and somebody's willing to pay for me to bring my athletes to come and compete in Russia, why, why would I say no? Uh, we have to see who blinks first. Um, it's going to take them quite a while to get the best to compete. But do Russia, do have, Russia have a right to want to say, okay, since you, I mean, it's like when we play sets, you have the ball, you don't want to play, hey, let me go and get my own ball and start my own set. No, they have the right you know, to, to organize a competition, but um, sometimes you need. IOC affiliation, you need a lot of technical assistance, you need the expertise. Exactly. People. For, some, for like example, some of the uh, officials, some of the best exactly. officials in the world are foreigners. So Would they be allowed to come? So how, how they are going to navigate, you know, how they are going to uh, get around this is what we are, what we, we, we are going to see in the, in the next few months. So um, for me, it's, it's the waiting game. Let's see how they do it. You know, so um, I really think Russia has a right organized but I don't see them going far okay that's, that's my opinion okay we'll, we'll, we'll keep a close eye on the friendship games that will be coming up later this year in September after the Olympic Games so uh, when Russia, they are reinstated what happens but, 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 till then. that's if they are reinstated uh, until, until then <laughs> until then uh, well you're still watching game one we'll take a short break when we return everybody knows about leagues we're talking about a different kind of league after the break Thank you for staying tuned. You're still watching Game On here on News Central TV. We've made a small switch now, and we have two fine gentlemen in the studio to come and talk about a unique type of league. I'm sure you've heard about uh, basketball leagues, football leagues, but have you ever heard about a boxing league? Well, joining us now in the studio is uh, Omole Yakubu Imadu. He's the CEO of Yucateco Boxing Promotions, and he's also the founder of the first 
ever boxing league in Nigeria. That's the Yucateco Boxing League. And beside him, on the far, that's my far right, that's Matthew Okube. Uh, he's the media manager of the Yucateco Boxing League. Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining us. So let me start with you, uh, Yakubu. Um, a boxing league, where did that idea come from? You know, everybody knows football league, basketball leagues, handball leagues, but a boxing league? Yeah, that, that given idea came out of passion, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, knowing fully well the vibrant potential of uh, uh, Nigerian boxers or we black men generally. Mm -hmm. And you see, the talent, the God given talent is there, but how come uh, we've not gotten a lot of uh, champions, you know, on a consistent basis? So uh, we discovered the, the major challenge and setback is just because there is no consistent platform where people get to exhibit their talent and pursue their career. And the only way we can do that, you can't achieve that just having uh, a one-time uh, boxing event and you have to wait another two months, three months, you know. Like you do, because I'm aware of the fact that you <laughs> hold regular boxing events, the Yucateco uh, Boxing Box, Night, yeah. yes, in, in, Ikorodu. in Ikorodu. So now instead of that, you decided to make it more regular, more regular. and have a league instead. Yes, thank you. So that that is, is, is consistent and um, uh, it gives a broader platform so that can actually uh, give opportunity to a whole lot of boxers, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, because, okay, let me just let me, let me look at this given scenario, right? Uh, in Ikorodu alone, maybe you have over 1,000 uh, boxers, talented boxers who actually want to take boxers as a career, right? And now, you have to wait every two years or four years to get a chance to go to either festival or you go to all African game or this. And when that time comes, the government can only take maybe 11, 12, as the case may be, yeah, like what we saw yeah, in this yeah, uh, just concluded yeah. all African game. Now, among 1,000 people, only 11 is going to be there. You miss that chance, you have to wait for another two years or four years. Mm. That means a lot of people along the line get discouraged about this given career that there's never going to be a platform for an opportunity if I miss this. Now, when a uh, private individual like us came with that initiative, how do we tackle this given situation? That's why out of passion, we said, okay, let's, let me start a league. So the league will continue to run on a yearly basis. If we have two seasons within a year, and each season is going to have um, a cycle of four months, okay. you know, so that means you can keep a whole lot of boxers. So if you don't active, make it yes. active, mm. so you train, you, you have an opportunity to actually exhibit your talent, waiting, whether your time comes to represent the country or not, you, are what, you have another platform that's going to be another gateway to being a champion. Okay, but the, are these professional boxers or amateur boxers? Well, in the very first season, you know, we, uh, which are mid season, we concentrated basically on amateur, mm. you know. Uh, but you can take a boxing league, basically, it's an international a body of its own that will be doing both amateur and professional okay. league. Okay. So we're making general preparation, strong one now, to have a, a professional league, a professional boxing in the league okay. coming up any, any moment from now. Okay. But that's going to be after, uh, the, after, after uh, this one. season two, season which two. is for the amateur. Okay, so Matthew, let me come to you. Season one, uh, of course, concluded. Absolutely. Uh, was, uh, from what we saw, was really good, really exciting. So, so tell us, how does this... How the format for this league, is it typical, uh, like football, where you have a uh, top of the table, relegation? Is it, how, how does this league work? We are, uh, basically, the systemics, some of the systemics of the league itself uh, is, uh, you would say, complex in some, some way. But uh, the dynamism of it also is the interesting part of it. Okay. We had, in the first season, we had over 20, we had precisely 20 boxing clubs. And the first season ran for precisely 14 weeks. Mm. So consistently, these boxers were fighting uh, every Friday and Saturdays. You understand? It started from Lagos, and the first season was in Lagos, uh, Ogun. We had this one in Ondo, and we also have in Oyo. So, so, this, so, was, so that's four different venues. Yeah, four, four different venues across four different states. Mm. So the consistency itself has also shown. And in every category, the boxers get to fight one another. Okay, so, so how many categories do you have? So for the first season, I think uh, we had about six, seven different categories. Okay. Yes, we had six, seven different categories. And there is a champion from each category. Okay. Each category is going to produce a, ch is a champion of their own. And not to forget, also we also have the female categories, where the females also from, all, from several weights also get to bout, uh, fight uh, one another. So these are some of the intricacies that... Uh, we were exposed to, especially in season one and season two, we hope that we'll be able to consolidate and begin to build a deal of. One very interesting uh, part to season one was the fact that we had over 200 
boxers from across Nigeria. Mm. You understand? Competing for uh, among the 20 different boxing clubs in all weight categories. Mm. So it was, uh, it's more like bringing Las Vegas to Lagos <laughs> if you've been to any of our venues. Nah, I, 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 I can I imagine. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. So, so we're talking about the structure itself. So do winners, uh, do they get like three points for a win? Uh, one point for a draw, no point for a loss. How, how does that work? I think he should be able to tell. <laughs> okay, talk okay. To me. Yeah. yeah, basically on the point on the point system, you know, uh, with the mechanics, you know, boxing is not like uh, uh, it's not, not football. like football, like football, you know, yeah. zero. Yeah, yeah, but we what we did, what we successfully uh, achieved, is making the uh, the point a two way benefit. So a part of the club, like if you win, when you win, automatically there's a given point that is attributed. To the club to the that club. you are representing, club, yeah. okay. and that same winning of yours is also going to hand you a given point, which puts you up the table in your weight categories. Yeah. Are you understand what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Just imagine if you win, you're going to have three points. Mm. So that three points automatically goes to your club, okay? Right for the club because mm. you represent the club, and uh, but you are also fighting for yourself as you are fighting for the clubs. Mm. So automatically, that your own winning also, also. irrespective whether you win by. Uh, Technical knockout, RSC, RSC, or whatever, is going to add a point. Okay. So basically, uh, you have four points on offer. Three points for your club and one point for you. No, no. Ah, okay. Three points is for the club points. Yes, yes. Then your own individual point is also three points. Three points. Oh, okay. Six points. So that's six, six points. Cumulatively, okay. six cumulatively points. Cumulatively, you know. And that pushes you on the ladder. So automatically, in your own weight category, you get to fight twice. Every given boxer in there in the weight category, they're going to... Uh, Fight each other twice, okay. home and away, ah, within the period of the league. So if you if you have the, like five people in your category plus you, that's six. That means you get to fight ten times. Uh, no, basically because you know if you have to fight yourself, Ryan, Imagine five people in your own weight categories, right? With yourself six. With yourself six. Mm. Automatically, you're gonna have to fight. Uh, yeah, ten times. Ten times. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 correct. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Oh, you have correct. any questions? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm looking at the business um, angle. You know how how do you <laughs> What's the implication financially for you? You know, um, how do you raise the funds? Because if, if you are going to, uh, if you are organizing a boxing league where you have, like he said, um, across four centers, you know, outside Lagos, it's, it's, um, it, it requires a lot of money, you know, for the teams, for the referees, you know, even for this stage I saw now, you know, the stage is not bad. So, yeah, so, so the packaging itself. So what, what has it cost you? Well, thank you very much. Um, you see, uh, you just asked me one of the most interesting parts First of, all. of this given project. And uh, I'm going to be technical about it. First and foremost, it cost me a whole lot of money. You know, is it the logistics? Are you talking about the branding? Are you talking about uh, um, the remunerations, the benefits? You know, but then the major motives basically is to develop the sport, put smile on them, and also create jobs. You know, because we have artisans, we have different people who benefited from the whole. Yeah, uh, food vendors, food uh, vendors uh, was, uh, transporters, there's even coaches, coaches men, exactly. medical personnel, even security, security medical, yeah. you know, and all that. Now, the issue is we happen to come from this part of this uh, a continent where your idea, no matter how good your idea is, you must be seen to put it on lamp like that. This is possible before anybody can buy into your idea. Mm -hmm. When just one person cannot do it alone. But how do you get sponsors? How do you go to people, oh, this is my idea. Come and put your money in it, right? They, they want to see the flipping. What have you been able to do with your idea? If your idea is so good, what risk have you taken that given idea of what yours? Steps but, you know, you what step have you taken? So I took it upon myself. This is passion, you know. And I spoke to my wonderful wife, you know. I said, you know what? I believe so much in this. Let's use what we have. Let's also leverage on our connections, you know, the well in Dow, you know. Put everything together and let's... Show Nigeria that this is possible. And hey, only season one, we spent nothing, nothing less than 200 million to achieve that four months program that has come to Lamlight. And, and guess what? Mm. The second season is about to come. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that. If, if you're saying season one was 200 million, that's Absolutely. almost a quarter of a billion. Absolutely. What can we look forward to for season two? Is it going to be bigger, better? Bigger, better. Stronger and wider in scope. So you had four venues in the season one. How many venues are we looking forward to in season two? Well, depending on the mechanics, uh, in season two, we want to make it national. We want to make sure every nook and cranny of Nigeria get to participate for as much as there is a God-given talent, 
in those given areas. And the venue. No, when you talk about venue, it all depends because I'm not going to say we're going to take it around the entire venue mm. because if there is instability in Bonu, for yes, example, yes, in a certain mm. area, we still it's not going to be able to benefit in terms of venue. Mm. But in terms of asset to your boxer, if you have a good, a good boxer in Bonu, we want to participate. We are developing the mechanism that they still get a chance to participate even though there's no venue. In so, the, for yeah. example, they might go to the nearest city, which might, be, might Bauchi, be the nearest city, or Yola, exactly, or Abuja. Take okay. So, give sense of belonging to every Nigerian. Mm. So, for, um, so when is this season two supposed to start? May twenty four. May twenty four. Yeah, and, and let me also come in. Uh, in season two, we're also looking at opening it out, uh, giving it uh, a stretch, especially uh, beyond just Nigeria. For oh, really, making it an international event. Uh, because it's also open for. Uh, boxers from especially neighboring West, West African Africa, countries. Yeah. Uh, we have other boxers. Boxers already showing interest. Uh, boxers will be coming in from places like Benin Republic, mm -hmm. uh, places Togo. like Togo, Ghana. Yeah, Ghana. So boxers are already uh, indicating interest. And the reason we are doing this is to ensure that we also give our boxers back home that international exposure. Mm -hmm. Some of these boxers have met themselves not once, not twice. But now, if they are meeting a boxer that is coming in from Ghana, just, some of them are having this feel for the very I, first I just, time. I'm just curious. So, is, it, is, so it, is, this is, is there any different fighting in Nigeria that is against, as against fighting a Benenoa or a Ghanaian? Ab, absolutely. Okay. There, 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 would be, there, there, there is a difference. I will tell you, each continent and uh, each given country mm. has their own system and style mm. of boxing. boxing. Style. You mm. understand? So these persons have been under the tutelage of certain coach and certain style some the Cuba style, some mm. the American style, some the, the British East, style. East, uh, East uh, yeah, style. Yeah. Mm. So these guys are coming with a different feel. You understand? So they are also exposed to this, and they might be seeing that for the very first time. So if these boxers are beginning to have this level of exposure, so it puts them in pole position by the time you take them for the All-Africa Games, by the time you take them for the Commonwealth Games, they, they, they become refined. Mm. So that is exactly what the Yucateco Boxing League is also looking at doing, especially from season two. Okay, in Lagos here, yeah, which venue do you use? Lagos, precisely, we, there are two, we, are, we are looking at three major venues okay. in Lagos. Mm. We're looking at the Yucateco headquarters, just like we did Nikorodu. in yeah. Nikorodu. We're looking at another venue in Agege, okay. and as well as the National Stadium, just okay. like we did uh, in the maiden season. So precisely this time around, we might decide to extend it, uh, Lagos being what it is, mm. and, uh, and still take it a notch further. Okay. 24th of May, the Yucateco, season two of the Yucateco Boxing League uh, will begin. And of course, uh, it's open to all amateur boxers uh, this season as well, male and female. So you know exactly where to go to get your punch on. Many thanks to you, Yakubo Imadu Omole, uh, founder of the Yucateco Boxing League. Of course, uh, Matthew Kube, who is the media manager of the Yucateco Boxing League as well. It's been very interesting listening to two gentlemen who have the idea for a boxing league, a different kind of league, and one full of punch. Uh, you're still watching that game one will take another short break of return. It's football all the way. Nigerians are not happy with the Super Eagles after just uh, two days. <laughs> but uh, we'll be right back. Thank you for staying tuned. You're still watching Game On here on New Central Television. We've made another switch. Okwe Adivari comes back, and it's time to talk football now. And let's start with the women. Matches are played in the NWFL today. And let's quickly give you the results of all those games. Plenty of them in Group A and in Group B coming up on your screen right now. In Group A, it was Adama Queens defeating Nigeria Tells 2-0. Royal Queens and Conference Queens, Queens played on the goal. Let's draw. Heartland Queens smashed Abia Angels 4-0, while National Amazons were 1-0 better than Dana's Ladies. Let's go to Group B now, where matches were also played there as well. There you go. Bielsa Queens were held to one-on draw by visiting Raymond Stars Ladies. Ekiti Queens also held Robo Queens to a goalless draw. Edo Queens were 4-2 better than Sunshine Queens in a six-goal thriller, while Rivers Angels also defeated Delta Queens by a lone goal. That's a women's football. Let's go to the men's game now and tell you that uh, there is some news coming out of the Nigeria Professional Football League, and it's that matches of match day 28 games have been postponed, according to uh, the uh, chief operating officer of the MPFL. The, it's moved because of logistics that uh, 
has to be put in place because of Federation Cup finals that will be played this weekend all across the country. Federation Cup finals will be played in order to find each state's representative for the for this season's uh, Federation Cup. So those games will be moved, uh, and the, in the memo that was sent to all 20 clubs today. So Federation Cup finals will be played all across this all across Nigeria this weekend, which means that you will not see uh, matches in the MPFL uh, because of those games. Those games have been rearranged for Wednesday, the 3rd of April. That's according to Davidson Oumi, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the MPFL. Of course, uh, for those who don't know, Davidson Oumi is a league legend himself, former top scorer uh, of the Nigeria Professional Football League and a star with Rangers International, amongst other clubs. Uh, let's also still stay with the Nigeria Professional Football League and tell you that Doma United have appointed a new technical advisor. Yes, his name is Coach Bala Abubakar, and he uh, he previously managed teams such as Lobby Stars, Quara United, Katina United, and he will assume a role of the technical advisor of the club. And it comes at a time where Doma United have been struggling with uh, performance. They are now in 13th place on the position, uh, not too far from relegation, and they are hoping that uh, Coach uh, Abubakar's uh, uh, Bala Abubakar's expertise will help them revitalize their league ambitions. Still sticking with uh, football now, and uh, we can tell you that Nigeria will be part of the upcoming Wafu Zone B Under-17 competition. That's Nigeria and six other teams will be competing in that uh, competition. Let's tell you that it's Nigeria, there's, Ga there's uh, Burkina Faso, Togo, Benin Republic, and Niger Republic, and as well as Cote d'Ivoire as well. Uh, that, those, uh, that competition will take place in Accra, capital of Ghana. And of course, if you've been watching this competition, don't forget that Nigeria are defending champions. It's uh, particularly crucial considering the fact that FIFA have now increased the FIFA Under-17 World Cup to 48 teams, and it will be an annual tournament from 2025, and the first five editions will be hosted by Qatar. So it's good timing that Wafu, competition, uh, Wafu countries are, uh, are, are preparing because, uh, believe it or not, the Wafu countries have always been really good in uh, Under-17 football. We talk about likes of Ghana, Mali, uh, Senegal, and, of course, Nigeria, who are five-time champions of the FIFA Under-17 World Cup. Right, uh, let's uh, remind you that uh, well, there was a friendly match played yesterday uh, in faraway Marrakesh. It was between, I called it the Battle of the Eagles. Mali, uh, the Eagles of Mali played against the Super Eagles of Nigeria. It ended 2-0 in favor of the Eagles of Mali. Uh, that meant that uh, caretaker coach George Finidi, Finidi George, uh, won one game against the Black Stars of Ghana, but lost the other. And it still puts the question to a lot of football fans. Do we need a foreign coach for Nigeria's national team, or do we need, uh, well, do we, do we need a, a domestic coach? Well, we went to the streets of Lagos today and asked fans what they think. Crowds are on their feet. Here it comes. Gabali, back post, chance, goal! Frank Kessier! Following Nigeria's loss to Ivory Coast in the Africa Cup of Nations final on the 11th of February 2024, many Nigerian football enthusiasts attributed blame to former coach Joseph Pesero's lack of tactical fluidity. Consequently, it was no surprise when the Portuguese tactician's contract was not renewed after it expired at the end of February. His record during his two-year tenure shows he was in charge of the Super Eagles for 22 games, recording 10 wins, 5 draws and 7 losses with a win percentage of 45.45%. With Pesero's departure, the long-standing debate among Nigerian football fans has resurfaced. Should the Super Eagles appoint a foreign or local coach? This question looms large over the future of Nigeria's beloved team. The problem we have is our boys, these traditional boys, bringing them for one week, two weeks to come and train doesn't help us at all. You can see there's no cooperation when they are playing. So we need local coach. I believe that if they uh, employ a foreign coach, it will help Nigeria move forward. Because uh, a little that I heard for the uh, former uh, coach now, uh, I believe that Nigeria performed a little bit. During the time of, if you remember, during the time of uh, Stephen Keshi and Abu Dushuai, all those uh, local play, uh, coaches, they performed very well, incredibly well. If you see the way Stephen Shetty did, he took Nigeria Super Eagles to a higher level. I think we should go for a local coach, actually to grow our local football and also our local content. Because we have so many stars, so many endowments in the country, scattered around the country. So if you actually have a local uh, manager, who can actually go around and scout for our talents in our universities. Mm. The debate continues to rage on. Should Nigeria go for a foreign coach or should Nigeria go for 
uh, domestic, uh, domestic coach, Finidi George. Well, I'm not sure how his performance in those two games rates, but it continues to cause, uh, do I say, debate amongst Nigerian football fans like you just saw right now. Oh, yeah, we already know where you sit. Uh, has your opinion changed at any point in time? No, I just wanted um, Jose Becerra to leave because mm. I felt he was not, um, <laughs> you know, using our full potentials. We mm. like uh, flu fluidity. We like, um, we play with flair. We have exciting, you know, offensive players. And he was too defensive for my liking. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the reason some players got injured because they defended so much True. at the Nations Cup. So I just wanted him out. And NFF has done that. Okay, he has gone now. Yes, but the debate here is, um, you know, it's neither here nor there. Uh, my, my worry today, I, I, I've said it severally, that if the football authority wants to change a coach, they should go ahead and employ a coach. Immediately, Jose Pesero left. That's what is obtainable in organized setting. Immediately, he left when his contract was not renewed. You start, before he, before, before he left, you start negotiating with your candidates, whether mm -hmm. local or foreign. Get a coach. That's the most important So that there will be no, be no this vacuum. Issue of caretaker, uh, what do they call it again? Interim. Like, interim. Does not, go, does not work well. Mm. Okay, Philippe George, two matches, he defeated Black Stars of Ghana. We were, by the way, we were in Ghana and uh, we had a bragging right. Uh, we talked to the Ghanaians, you know, the way we wanted. Well, <laughs> well, we defeated them because they are the, you know, there are, are, are some characters in Ghana. Anytime Ghana defeats Nigeria, mm. So mm. You, you, you just look for somewhere and hide. Don't go out. Don't go out. So, mm. so after that game, he had a bragging, but he has lost to Mali. And people are saying uh, he's, he's, he's no longer the coach that. Uh, that they, that, that, uh, He's no longer the Messiah. But, exactly. but, but, but okay, I mean, coaches lose all the time. It's part of the job, isn't it? But should we just look at that? Do we now take that loss as the reason why we don't want to go forward with George Finito? Or is it just a convenient uh, nail to hang his coat? Of course. It, it's convenient for those who want a specific candidate. In my own opinion, I think we still played well against Mali. At the end of the day, it was individual errors that cost us that win. And also, we created chances, but we did not just dispatch um, those chances that were created. And when I say we didn't dispatch it, I'm, I'm talking about Cyril Dezas. I'm talking about um, Ademola Lukman towards the end of the game as well. So for me, we still played well. We, play, we played the type of football that I do like to see. Just like I said um, last week, same formation per serial use, different implementation. Mm. We played out from the back. Stanley Wabali became part of the back four. Bright Osai Samuel inverting. The midfielders in so you, strategic you like, positions. You like what I like you what saw. I see. I like what I see. But, it's but they couldn't personnel. break down a better, a better yes, Malian. Yes, so. two, two, two major reasons. Number one, this squad of players assembled by the technical department of the NFF, not, not the Finidi George. Okay. Finidi George took this as his own um, audition to, to be the coach. That's why he stuck with a certain number of players and he refused to spice up the team because he wanted to win the game. Second reason? Um, second reason for me definitely had to be the fact that the, the Malians, they had more reason to win the game. Um, 11 debutants for them. These players are not regulars for the Malian first team. They had an opportunity to stake a claim for themselves, so they were hungrier for the win. Okay. Well, uh, I, I mean, the debate will continue to rage on, but here uh, on, on the show, we are always uh, advocate for the best manager for the Super Eagles of Nigeria. But let's tell you that that, that game against uh, Mali came at a cost for Nigeria because we heard that Super Eagles winger and not winger as well, Mozi Samon, is out for the rest of the season uh, with an ankle injury that sustained uh, in that game. Uh, that there he was. He seemed to be through on goal and collided with the goalkeeper. Seemed to, seemed to knock was, uh, but he went down, never came up again, and uh, we've been told that he's out for the rest of the season, how that affects Nigeria's uh, uh, chances at the World Cup. Uh, for the World Cup qualifiers, we do not know. Uh, it's talking about uh, this week, this uh, uh, week, uh, summer's European Championships, we now know the full complement of teams that will be uh, in Germany after Georgia, Ukraine, and Poland completed the lineup this weekend. Uh, just yesterday, I beg your pardon. So we know in Group A, it's Germany, Scotland, Hungary, and Switzerland. Group B, Spain, Croatia, Italy, and Albania. Group C, Slovenia, Denmark, Serbia, and England. Group D, Poland, Netherlands, Austria, and France. Group E, Belgium, Slovakia, Romania, and Ukraine. While well, it's Group F, Turkey, Georgia, Portugal, and the, Repo the Czech Republic. So we're looking forward to a really great tournament this week, uh, this summer. Uh, in the European Championships. Guys, it's been fun. It's been entertaining. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome pleasure. back to Nigeria. Uh, we're still going to talk offline about what happened in Ghana. <laughs> but okay, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so Many much. Thanks to the guys behind the scenes who made it, uh, it possible as well. But before we go, let's uh, tell you that in uh, 2013, uh, Jake Livermore, Hall City midfielder, broke a, a very expensive camera while celebrating a goal for Hall City against Cardiff City. Yeah, he kicked the camera in while trying to uh, celebrate his goal. And the, 
photo photographer who owned the camera, Richard Heathcote, was very unhappy, calling out the player on Twitter. But thankfully, uh, because we live in the age of social media, uh, Livermore got in touch with Heathcote to confirm that he'll make the necessary arrangements to have the camera fixed, but he also made a donation of the same amount to a charitable cause. But unfortunately for Hull City, they were ultimately Hull to a one-all draw in that same game, so his celebration was all for naught. Well, that's our show this evening. Many thanks once again for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow on Game On. My, my name is Babatunde Koeki. Wishing you a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.